Yolanda Faye joined the U.S. Air Force just days after graduating college a year early. Soon after separating, she became the queen of military spouses and eventually started her own business as a family consultant and ran that for about 25 years. Now she's earning an MBA while she starts another business. Take a look at the interview I had with a person that is often referred to as a powerhouse, U.S. Air Force veteran Yolanda Faye. <laughs> Hey everybody, you're listening to the Knight's Tale Podcast, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Yolanda Fay, a U.S. Air Force veteran that earned degrees from the University of Texas and the University of San Francisco. She's been self-employed for more than 25 years, so she has a wealth of knowledge in terms of her philosophies for getting new customers, self-development, and being her own boss. She currently resides in San Francisco and runs her own business called Revio as well. So I'm really excited because she's an entrepreneur, and I thought it would be great to hear her thought process and tactics that she used regarding overcoming any challenges of her transition out of the military and how she used the military as a springboard for her future success. So please join me in welcoming Yolanda Faye. Yolanda, how are you? I'm good. Robert, thank you so much for having me. This is exciting. Of course. I'm um, really excited to have you. So could you uh, talk a little bit about your military transition and um, like how you got into the military? Oh, that's a big question. So um, how I got into the military, I was born and raised in Northern California, right outside of San Francisco here. And I was the product of the summer of love. And so my mother was a hippie. My mother and father were both hippies. And um, <laughs> they had that San Francisco um, psychedelic experience. Um, which I tell people, I, as the byproduct of that, it was not as glamorous as people want to make it out to be. There was a lot of things happening about, you know, obviously we had some civil rights movement stuff going on. We had people kind of thwarting that, um, you know, the sexual revolution, as they're calling it. Um, and then there were a lot of the, the drug use that was going on, kind of the widespread um, use of psychedelics and, and opioids and that, and, you know, marijuana, whatever. Hmm. So um, that transitioned from into me living in a nudist colony with my mother, and, um, and that was a whole different experience. I went from there into foster care, because that doesn't <laughs> bode well for children in their life. And um, came back into my mother's home uh, when I was kind of around uh, eight, nine, and then spent a lot of time living kind of a gypsy life with my mother. And, and uh, I have two older sisters, so they kind of were in and out of that. And then I have a younger sister that's 12 years younger. And um, we ended up being homeless and doing lots of camping and lots of um, what a lot of people that are from Northern California that were involved in that kind of fell into. Um, this thwarting the system and the man, and and uh, we're not buying into that. We're going to go do our own thing. We're going to live off the land. You're not going to tell us. We're not following the rules, um, which is great and fine unless you're a kid being drugged through that, and then it's not great and fine. Okay. So at uh, I graduated high school at 17 years old, wow. and I realized that my way out of that situation, which I did not want to be in, and I was not, it, you know, it's not a secure place. It's not safe for a young, you know, especially not a young girl, but it's not safe for a young person and a young mm -hmm. developing mind. So I went to the University of Santa Cruz um, at 17 years old, I ended up graduating in two years and ended up um, getting ready. I was supposed to be going to law school and I was walking by a grocery store. I was already in debt. I had taken out um, student loans. Right. And so I walked by a recruiter's office and I was trying to figure out how I was going to pay for law school. And right. I thought, man, I'm already in debt. I'd like this, like when you start seeing double digits and thousands as a young person who's never had any money, you're like, whoa, that, whoa, I don't even <laughs> like that money doesn't even make sense to me. I don't know. I'm never going to make that much money. <laughs> so I thought I like airplanes, you know, Air Force recruiter's office. And I was like, I love airplanes, man. I'd love to be a pilot. Still to this day, I've never been a pilot. I would love to be a pilot. Um, and so I walked in there and started talking to the Air Force recruiter and, um, Back in the day, it's long before people used to um, plan to take the ACT or, or any of that. Um, it was not a test that was used for getting into university at that time. Mm. And he said, hey, you want to take this test real quick? And I can tell you what you can do and what you, you know, I said, okay. So I took the test. He said, I'll take about a week and a half to get the results back. 
So I take the test. I'm waiting. It's is in uh, May, right after gra- I literally had graduated maybe two or three days, you know, earlier. <laughs> and I literally uh, got a phone call saying, you scored the top 1% of the country. What do you want to do? Wow. And I was like, I want to be a pilot. <laughs> He's like, Hold on. No, that's actually not going to work. Now, if I knew then what I knew now, I knew that it would absolutely be an option if I knew what I was doing, but I didn't. So he goes, well, let's get you into basic training. Let's do this whole thing. I said, oh, okay, great, fine. So I left uh, a few weeks later, just two or three weeks later, got put all my stuff in storage and hopped up, went over to Oakland MEPS. And mm. next thing you know, I'm on my way to, to Lackland Air Force Base. Wow. So I show up at Lackland Air Force Base. And the only question I had during this entire process with the recruiter was, I have very long hair, very long hair. So it's all <laughs> the way down to my, to my, uh, waist. Mm -hmm. And at the time it was all the way down to my knees. And I had said, I don't, am I going to have to cut my hair? And he said, as long as you can keep it in 3510, you can keep your hair. I said, all right. So man, I I had that little piece of 3510 out there. What am I have to do to keep my hair? (laughs) Priorities, right? As a young 19 year old woman. Um, And so I showed up and they said, oh, you're going to have to cut your hair. And so my military experience started out with me telling the TI, I was not going to cut my hair, but I would keep it in 3510. And this is back in the day where they could still kind of physically assault you a little bit. And he took his TI bill and he smacked it in the bridge of my nose several times. And I'm five foot two. I'm a little teeny tiny thing. Mm -hmm. And he was smacking it in my face. And he said, let me be very clear. The first time your hair is on a 3510, I'm going to shave your head myself. Oh my God. So I am all about 3510. I have hair, like my hair is always sharp and tight and, you know, all (laughs) sorts of different hairstyles, but all within regulation. So Wow. Showed up at basic training and um, spent my time there, rose to the top because for me, all the structure, all the security, mm-hmm. three squares, just have to move some stuff and some people yelling at me. I'm like, this is easy. No problem. Exactly. You know, I got to bed every night. This is awesome. <laughs> um, and so about, um, about four weeks in, I got a, a container from the University of Santa Cruz and um, my TI said, Emma McConnell, what is this? And I said, um, oh, that's probably my degree from the University of Santa Cruz. He goes, your degree? I wow. said, yes. He goes, why are you enlisted? I said, oh, I want to see the country, sir. He goes, no, but why are you? I was like, I, I don't know what. He goes, you're going to need to talk to the commander. So mm-hmm. I go down and start talking to the 06. He asked me again, why would you enlist? I want to serve my country, sir. But why would you enlist? Well, I want to see the word world, sir. He goes, but why would <laughs> you enlist? I said, I don't think I understand what you're asking. <laughs> So it, he explained to me at that time, the whole officer enlisted thing. And he said, you could be an officer. And I said, oh, okay. I didn't even understand what that meant. And I said, what does that entail? And he said, well, you could be right now. What we have open is a finance officer. I said, oh, oh. finance officer. Okay. What's that going to do? And he said, oh, you take care of people's money. Like I said, oh, like an accountant behind a desk. It's like, that sounds terrible. <laughs> so he said, if you want to stay in, what job would you have as an enlisted person that would you like? And he goes, we have a job as a dental technician that mm. it requires a little bit more education and it requires a little bit more, you have to have pretty high score, ACT score, and it, you're pretty dedicated. And, and then it's a, um, a nice, not cush, but he said, it's a nice you know, job that you will transition into civilian sector very easily. Mm-hmm. So I stayed enlisted. And I became a dental technician and I um, did everything across the board, but I did pediatric, um, had neck deformities. I worked wow. general dentistry for a while. I did some forensic dentistry stuff, which I really uh, loved. And then um, I married another service member after four years um, <laughs> who was an officer. So we never dated. We just got married. Um, and part of my, um, part of my coordinating my future marriage was we're both Jewish. And so I wanted to go through marriage counseling through a rabbi that I found a Marine rabbi. We're stationed in Misawa, Japan. I found a rabbi down in Okinawa, a Marine called him up and said, Hey, would you be willing to do couples counseling for an officer and enlisted? He said, absolutely. I went to the chaplain on base and said, hey, I've got a rabbi who's willing to do the counseling if you'll support us, but I want to stay active duty while we go through this counseling. Um, but now we're going to be a visible officer enlisted fraternization couple. And he said, I'm behind you 100%, Yolanda. Um, and then we had to go talk to the general and explain to him while we're getting married. Now, this general 
who I have had a lot of experience with, and I did a lot of work in Northern Japan with this general on a volunteer basis and really um, doing some international stuff of getting the military active duty service members as well as the civilian community to start um, interacting quite a bit. We invited them on the base for various things. They invited us downtown. I was golfing with the mayor. So it was a very high profile international community that I was creating. Wow. And um, so I, we went through couples counseling and then I, um, we got married about three months later. And then I became the spouse of the medical readiness officer and the chief of physical therapy. And um, that's how I got in and got out of the military. What's fascinating about my getting out of the military is I didn't have a big transition. And at that time, I got out in 1994. I joined in 1990, out in 1994. Um, and they did not give me any, no briefing, no goodbyes, no, you know, smack on the back of the head and say, go do your thing. Um, literally, I signed my paperwork and left, you know, and then I was a spouse. Um, so what they didn't do at that time is they didn't walk me through things that I was entitled to. They didn't walk me through various, um, and I don't know how deep you want to go here, but they yeah. didn't walk me through various medical issues that had, had um, arised when I was um, in the military. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have that, um, the beauty of having that guidance to get out and transition. Right. Now, long story short, I was married for 24 years. Um, he ended up uh, being um, the core chief of the biomedical science corps for the Air Force. Uh, at one point was deputy surgeon general, USF Forces Korea. We had 14 assignments in 24 years. Wow. And I did a lot everywhere I was at. Um, however, when I got out of, you know, when I, I divorced and got out of that and I actually went to figure out what's the base and, and started actually asking about various opportunities or, you know, education or various things I was entitled to as a veteran, mm -hmm. um, I found a whole nother world of, of access, um, services, uh, money that was to be, that I could tap into for various things, mm -hmm. resources. Um, I'd already been a senior military spouse uh, advisor for the officers clubs group. I'd always been like the president or I'm um, always the president generally of the officer spouses. So 14 assignments um, and then was a senior, uh, military senior advisor um, for the last couple assignments where I worked with large um, organizations to within the community. Again, I'm big on wherever I'm living, I'm making that world a better place. <laughs> so at that point, wow. it was, how are we going to start an orphanage to, you know, get these local young girls in Asia and Korea, South Korea specifically, how are we going to get them? Um, how are we going to take care of them? That's one of the big issues that was happening when I was in Korea is little girls um, being discarded for lack of a better world mm. and, um, and, or killed or thrown away or found in dumpsters or that type of thing. So uh, we as an organization started an orphanage to kind of combat that community. And we do know that oftentimes there's military service members who were the fathers of some of those babies and a mixed race baby in Asia, if, especially if you don't have a father, you know, you just, as the Korean woman, she'll be ostracized by her family. And so her only, oftentimes the women that I would talk to who started coming to us, that was their only hope was to get rid of the baby so that they could continue their life and not be thrown out of their families. Because if they kept the baby, what we saw and happened almost across the board is they were ostracized and they were um, exiled from their families. Wow. So, yeah. That so is, there you go. There's the, there's the beginning. <laughs> wow. Wow. That is incredible. So you've been impacting the world, uh, you know, on a, on a really grand level um, for a long time. One human connection at a time. That's what I tell people. If you want to ch change the world, you want to really be a better person, you want to really make an impact in the world around you, mm -hmm. one human connection at a time. It doesn't, it, it could be a person at the CVS behind the counter right. that you connect with, that you, you smile at, you have a little conversation. <laughs> and when you walk away and that person has a big grin on their face and a sparkle in their eye that they didn't have before then, that's a person that, you know, like, I just made that person feel good. I just helped that person have a little, whatever they're dealing with, because we're all dealing with something. 
right. whatever that person's dealing with, they just got a little bit of joy and a little bit of happiness. And if they're going to pass that on to the next customer that they see, give a little bit of joy, a little bit of happiness, it has a ripple effect. It so does. I start small effect from my daily human connections with people to large grand um, effect that is helping save lives of people that um, wouldn't have an opportunity otherwise. Wow, that's, that's amazing. So um, we know that a lot of entrepreneurs that caught the entrepreneurial bug early in life, and it seems like you've had a lot of experiences that make you want to take uh, life by the, the horns and things like that. Um, where did your entrepreneurial journey start? You know, I really think um, the seed started when I was young as a homeless kid. Um, because I was kind of abandoned, I, nobody ever told me I couldn't. Nobody, you know, uh, there's a lot of really negative talk out there where people go, oh, no, you can't do that. Or, oh, right. no, you're a girl. Or, oh, no, you're, a, you're, you're broke, you're homeless, you're poor, you're, you're yeah. whatever, you're, you're white, you're black, you're, you know. <laughs> dyslexic, whatever the, the verbiage is that they want to tell you you can't do. Mm -hmm. Because I was alone and, and left alone, nobody ever told me that. So if I thought I want to do, you know, I'd think, okay, well, I need to eat. Okay, so I'm going to learn how to fish. Okay, well, I'm tired of being at this campsite by myself with this young person I was left with, my young sister who I'm 12 years older than. You know what? I'm going to walk out of there. I'm going to walk 60 miles into town. Yeah, okay, what? whatever. So my whole life was kind of Oh, okay, well, I'm going to do that. Nobody ever said, oh, you can't do that. And there's never a, a thought in my mind that, oh, I'm, I can't do that. I'm incapable. Mm. So when I saw something that needed to change, whether it was, again, saving babies or for the case of how I became Biloxi Woman of the Year, um, I saw, I walked into the hospital. My ex-husband was, uh, we were at Keesler Air Force Base. He was the medical readiness officer of the major medical center. And when I went to see him one day, I, I don't know how it happened, but I ended up in the pediatric oncology ward. And I, I don't know why I was there, but I was looking around. I thought, man, these walls are so white. I thought, man, kids are dying here. This is horrible. This sucks. You know, and the families are spending months here. And, and I, oh, I think what I had done is I had, I had done a potluck for the Fisher House mm. on base. And I think that that's what I had done is they had said there were families because I said, are these all your families? And they said, no, we have some that are over at, on the oncology ward with the pediatric patients, but they stay there most of the time. Mm -hmm. I said, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go deliver some meals over there to those families that are in the, that situation. That's how I ended up there. Wow. And as I started walking to these rooms and, hey, could I come in and say hi? And, da, 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 da. Uh, and I was the president of the military uh, medical officer spouses. And I delivered these, these meals and just saw the, the pain in these people's eyes, the fatigue. Mm. Uh, the injury, the, the, the physical and the emotional injury that these people were experiencing, put, you know, watching their child die. So I left there and went and uh, knocked on a friend of mine's door and I said, hey, I have something I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to need some money donated. And she just looked at me and gets her purse, which most people who know <laughs> me are like, okay, Yolanda, how much money? <laughs> so I'm going to need a couple hundred dollars. I'm going to, I got a little project I'm doing. Nobody seemed to ask me what project I was going to do right away <laughs> until I went up, I went into the hospital commander, General um, Dan Locker, who is an amazing man. And I said, sir, I've got a, um, an idea. I want to paint the pediatric oncology ward. I want to paint themed rooms. How many rooms you have? He said, well, we have 16 rooms. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I'm going to paint 16 themed hospital rooms. And, and, and he said, well, we also have a, um, a playroom up there. I said, all right, fine, uh, let me go see it. So I went and toured all of that. The playroom has to maintain a sterile environment. Right. And so only one child can be in there at a time and then they have to sterilize everything. Mm. So I ended up painting, uh, the, the playroom was an underwater theme room. Um, and I treated each room. I don't know if you're familiar with the I Spy books. And an I Spy is I spy with my little eye, uh, <laughs> a jellyfish. I spy right. with my little eye, a uh, uh, anchor. Mm -hmm. So I made an I spy with a key for each room that you could find various things, mm -hmm. find Pluto. So I did a space, an astronaut room where there was, um, uh, there was a space shuttle and there was an astronaut and there was the whole solar system and, <laughs> you know, black holes and, you know, and then a little bit of education of what that was. And I did a, um, I did a jungle room with all of the various jungle animals and, I ended up getting 
artists from around the community. I ended up getting about, there's probably about, I'm all told, about 50 people that helped me with this year long project. Hmm. Because of course we could only paint rooms that weren't being used, okay. right? And so they would have to move a patient or if there was a, a room open, we'd have to play a lot of room. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I only had the room generally for two days, like the weekend time of a room. Mm -hmm. um, and so we finished 16 rooms, a huge uh, underwater playroom. And wow. um, I got nominated uh, and won Angel of the Year for the Air Force, which is a volunteer recognition, Air Force wide. They give it to one person a year. Wow. Uh, of course, I won the Base Volunteer of the Year award. And then I won Biloxi, Biloxi Woman of the Year. And um, <laughs> For me, it just, it all seemed, it, it was all a little bit too much because I wasn't, that's not why I do anything. And so I'm always a bit like, oh yeah, 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 but that's fine. It's well, whatever. I'm already <laughs> on to something else. I'm already, I'm already doing something else. We're already moving on. So no, no problem. So um, it all comes from, again, with seeing a need, a basic need that I know that I can personally take care of. So my entrepreneurial aspect of that came when I started deciding, not just as a military spouse, which I was running these organizations, these nonprofits, and I was working 40, 50, 60 hours a week, spending a lot of my own money, getting people to donate money, um, but I wasn't getting paid for it. So to transition that work into civilian, you know, people want to know, what was your salary? Who were you working for? Well, I was working for a nonprofit at the military base and you know, oh, well, you know, who can I talk to? Oh, well, okay. I was the president. So the other thing, you know, I mean, it's just, it's hard to transition that into, right. um, into a, a job or a career, if you will. I did happen to do it and I happened to do it on complete whim, like everything else in my life, which was, I got divorced. I had zero money. I decided that I was okay. I've got a new um, stage in my life. I never ever thought I'd be divorced. Um, and I walked out of that court courtroom and I'm a person that I'm not overly religious, but I'm incredibly spiritual and I have deep, deep faith. And I thought, well, I have no money. What I'm gonna do? And I thought, well, God will provide. Has up until this point, everything, you know, I just happened to walk into things. <laughs> and so I walked out of that courtroom and I ran into somebody I had not seen in 15 years. And she said, oh my God, I was just talking about you this morning. I said, really? <laughs> she goes, yeah. She goes, I just told my husband that we're building a house. We're building our dream home. And I thought, man, if Yolanda was here, she would help me to be able to. And I had not talked or seen this woman for 15 years. And I looked at her, she goes, are you available? What are you doing here? And I said, oh man, that's a whole nother story. I said, I am available. I said, but this time I'm going to charge you. I had helped her at one point in her life revamp a home that she had and um, had done it as a friend. And I knew that she was going through some stuff in her life. And I thought if your environment around you, your direct area is beautiful and makes you feel good, you sleep better at night, you feel better, you want to come home. Right. Um, and so I said, yes, but I'm gonna charge you. And she goes, well, there's the general. She, you know, she's already got <laughs> something. She's asking me for money and it's not a donation this time. <laughs> so there started the general and it is a nickname. And I started a company at that point where it was completely word of mouth. I never um, advertised. I never made a business card for it. You had to know somebody that worked with me and I would go into people's homes and I would help them turn those homes into the places that they felt were their best space, that they could live their best life. They could work, you know, they had worked very hard. These are, I, I was not cheap. I'm not, I'm not a discount helper. <laughs> um, and so I charged a lot of money and um, worked with these people. It takes about a year. And it would get to where we would touch everything that was in your life. We would touch every photograph, every book, every something. And I would say, you know, and, and it wasn't me coming in, cleaning out your house. It was your whole family has to take time off work. You have to take leave. You have to take vacation time. Um, and it's going to cost you some money because you're paying me. And I stay with the families. Mm. So my first interview with them is we sit down and we have dinner. And I talk with everybody, what everybody's ideas and expectations are. And then talk about what it is. Where do you see yourself? What is missing? Oftentimes they don't know. People say, oh, you're a life coach. No, if I was a coach, you'd already be doing it. So I'm not a coach. I'm a life fixer. So I walk into those space and I look around and I stay with you for three days on the front end and we work 18 hours a day. Then I come back in six weeks and we do it again until your house is done. While I'm gone, there are projects that you need to do. There's things that you have to decide on or work through. 
and it will be sometimes as easy as when I show up at your door day one, moment one, the whole family's sitting around the kitchen having their morning coffee, and we start, because I'm military, we start at 6.30 every day, which most people are not used to getting their, their groove on at 6.30 in the morning. We start at 6.30 in the morning, and I just pay attention to how you guys interact, what's going on in your world, whatever. So sometimes it'll be as simple as, well, it's this morning, we're training the dog. Because every time that doorbell rings, every time somebody opens that door, that dog bolts out of there. And I've watched everybody in this family run outside and spend 25 minutes, 30 minutes trying to catch that dog. Mm. So this morning, I'm going to teach you guys how to train the dog. So the dog can sit at place at the rug. You can open the door. You can come and go as you want to. But that's stressful. If you're trying to get stuff done and the dog runs out, that is a stressful situation. <laughs> so it will be things like that. It will be sometimes the disrespect that children have towards their parents this just blatant, nasty, disregard and disrespect for the things that their parents are doing. So when the general shows up, uh, that changes. Your life changes. So we will structure the kids' schedules. We will, I will remove things. And I, I believe that you earn things. Nothing is given. So my, and they sign a contract. So everybody signs a contract that the general has the final say in everything, period, end of conversation. Now I work with you. But I really do, at the very end of the day, what, what I say goes, I very rarely have to use that, but I do. And with children, I definitely use it. Mm. Um, and so I say, you know what, let's get your space where it should be. And then we're going to start adding back based on your behavior. Oh, you have C's in school? Well, that means that you actually don't have any technology because your job as a child is school. So until you are a good student, now if you're only capable of C's, then we'll talk. But you're not, you know, probably capable of seeds. You're probably capable of more than that. And family has to exercise. You know, this like no, no sitting around watching TV all day, whatever. The family, I will send people to marriage counseling. I'll send people to family counseling. I'll help you find a family counselor or a marriage counselor. Um, I'll send them to a personal trainer. I'll send them to a nutritionist. I'll revamp their food and say, all this processed food y'all are eating, you feel like crap. And this is why. You know, this is not healthy for your body, and this does impact your psyche, your um, the way you move, the way you feel. So, you know, putting all of this into your body is not healthy. So it, it's a long process. My clients will tell you it's life-changing. Um, they are my clients for life. Again, you have to know somebody who I've worked with to get a hold of me. Um, so somebody recently just called me and said, oh, you did so-and-so's house and I'd love to have you come and, um, meet with us. She goes, oh, I heard that there's a process. I said, yes, a process. <laughs> and she said, I'd love to have you come meet with us. Unfortunately, I'm not taking on any new life fixing clients right now, because as you mentioned earlier, I am launching a company called Revyo. Revyo is the, um, is the product of a hobby that I have, and I love jewelry. Mm -hmm. I just think jewelry makes me feel happy. I love it. It's, uh, it's my happy place. So while I was stationed in South Korea, I, oh, about 20 years ago, I would fly into China, into Beijing, into the jewelry markets, and I would design my own jewelry. I would find some nice little jeweler. I'd go, oh, I kind of want this and that. And I, I started this whole thing. And so for about mm -hmm. six months, I was going and just designing a bunch of my own jewelry. And then I had friends that would say, oh yeah, and I'd go for the weekend. It was a, you know, it was a Friday night. It's an hour and a half. It was like going to Vegas from California. It's just right. a pop over and pop home. So <laughs> I'd go for, you know, two, two nights, three days type of thing. And someone would say, oh, Yolanda, you know that red necklace that you made with the blah, 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 blah. I'd say, oh yeah, yeah. Will you make one of those for me this time? I said, oh, all right, okay. I said, but you know, I'm just gonna charge you the, what it costs, you know, the supplies, the, the cost of the product. Oh yeah, fine. So I was coming back and it's, you know, pennies really. So I'd give everybody and then it turned into friends of friends. Then it turned into people who I didn't know who were calling me and said, oh, you're designing jewelry and you go to China. Can I get some whatever <laughs> I saw? And then I got smart and I thought, oh wait, hold on. I can't, you know, I'm not just paying. At, the, at that point I had been paying for my own product at that time. But mm -hmm. I thought, wait a minute, I could actually pay for my trip. If I actually just, not scalping these people, but if I just charge them a reasonable amount. And because I am who I am and I like matchy-matchy and I like, you know, always being put together, um, a necklace, a bracelet, a pair of earrings, and if I can swing in a ring, um, is what I sell. I don't just, you don't get just a necklace or just a bracelet or just a pair of earrings. You get a set because I think oftentimes women struggle with putting all of that set together mm -hmm. and they don't really get to um, kind of feel their best self. And so you get a set and I, my sets were ranging between 55 and $125. 
uh, all freshwater cultured pearls, uh, semi-precious stones, silver, um, and 20, uh, well, usually I was using 14 karat gold, sometimes 18 and 24 karat, but that starts getting expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started paying for my own trip. And then once I started paying for my own trip, then I started paying for more trips. And then I started realizing I was making some money off of it. And so I did launch a company. I launched a jewelry company and I had, a, I had moved at that point with PCS to England hmm. and I opened a little tiny shoebox store in London and was only open from um, 8.30 in the morning until 3.30 in the afternoon, Monday through Friday, because I had kids in school mm -hmm. and I dropped them off every day and I picked them up every day and um, I was going to China every 10 weeks. And I had took the money out of our, had taken the money out of our um, savings account and thought, well, I'll pay myself back as it comes in. And I heard from more business owners, oh, it takes five years to pay yourself back. And with those hours, you're never going to be <laughs> successful and never. So I opened up my shop and um, I was completely sold out the first two weeks of my business. I had paid myself back within the first <laughs> month of my business. Um, I was going to China every 10 weeks for 10 days. I ended up um, literally decided at one point I was gonna go into, they have a fashion school in London and I was gonna go talk to some of the young fashion designers. Their end of the um, program, uh, their thesis, if you will, project was they ran a fashion show. Mm. So I started talking with a bunch of the different fashion designers. And the one thing that I think is missing in a lot of fashion shows is nice jewelry to match the you know outfits. Right. So I talked to a couple that I really liked their stuff knowing they didn't have any money. And as an entrepreneur, you're always looking at an angle, right? <laughs> so for me, I thought, hey, I have to go to all these balls. My um, ex-husband was the Surgeon General of USAFIS at the time. Yeah. And I'm always like, you know, three balls a week. And then I have, you know, major stuff I have to do. Mm -hmm. And then ball gowns are expensive. You don't know about ball gowns? Ball gowns, will, you are broke. <laughs> uh, you know, whoo. So I talked to these fashion designers and I said, hey, I will design jewelry if you're interested for your entire line. We'll work together on, on what that would look like. And in return, you design one dress gown for me and we'll just do an exchange. You'll get to keep the jewelry and all, I mean, if it sells and every one of them said, no, if it sells, you keep that money. I said, oh, perfect. All my jewelry sold. Mm. I got about 15 gorgeous custom made ball gowns that were, were handmade for me by these up and coming fashion designers that were phenomenal. Mm. And so I really, truly, that's how it started. Now, I will tell you, as every entrepreneur knows, and most of them that I have, have dealt with um, also experience this, sometimes you make bad business decisions. My bad business decision had nothing to do with my business model or my product or my location. That was all, I was killing it. I had people that were volunteering who loved my line so much. They were volunteering to come help me do inventory and tag things when I got back from China so that they could have the choice of buying it first. <laughs> didn't get a discount, you yeah. didn't get free stuff. You just got to first choice, first dibs wow. on whatever it was. So I had people volunteering to do that. Hmm. It was so it was so busy and I was so consumed with how, the, how much people wanted my product that I ended up ha had a friend who was in the issue school she was a Dodds um, administrator and she hated it she hated yeah. every minute of it her husband worked um, in Intel he was a civilian contractor and she loved jewelry I thought she was a dear friend of mine I'd known her for a couple of years at this point and she asked to come into business with me. And I thought, oh, this would be fantastic. This is, you know, it's not just me anymore. I could have a, and not a travel buddy because it's work. And when you're working, you have somebody else there. Sometimes that's distracting, but just somebody I could kind of share the work with, right? right. The workload, because it was such a big workload. Um, so I took her on in business. I took her with me to China. I introduced her to all my contacts. I taught her how to the layout and design of jewelry. Um, I taught her kind of what works, what doesn't work from business aspect. And then um, about, oh, I guess it would be about um, three months after that, my mother got sick in San Francisco mm. and I had to come back as an emergency. And uh, my mother ended up passing away. So I was oh, here sorry, in California. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I have a little a true belief that the day that my mother died was the day that my, me and my children were supposed to be in um, 
in London in a tube station going to a program I'd set, uh, had enrolled my children in in the Victoria and Albert Museum. And that was the day of the London bombing was the same day that my mother died. So I really truly believe my mother's death sa saved mine and my children's life. And um, I do believe everything happens for a reason. Right. And um, so she passed away. I thought, okay, I have this business partner now. She's going to take care of everything. This is great. Um, now, my future self, I mean, my previous self would have just closed the shop and said, I'll put it on a sign on the door, which is my MO, and said, hey, I'll see y'all when I'm back and see you then. <laughs> and people would have been fine with that. Right. But I was happy to be able to keep my business going. Fortunately, when I got home 30 days later, my space was empty. Hmm. My storage um, for my product was empty. All my inventory was gone. Hmm. My bank account, which I had put her in and, and given her access to, was completely um, empty. And she had placed several thousands, tens of thousands of dollars worth of product um, purchases from my contacts in China, who I started getting phone calls from saying, oh, you owe us $28,000. We haven't gotten your stuff. We've sent the product. And... Wow. Was beyond, I, I just was floored and shocked. And the yeah. thing that for me as an entrepreneur in this situation, there's a couple things that I feel are really important. One is to be an American. Mm -hmm. Failure is just a, you know, in business, if you fail once, that's a learning curve. Mm -hmm. Nobody, it's not, it doesn't end your career. It doesn't end who you are. Nobody says, oh, you had a bad, you know, whatever. We no longer trust you unless you have some sort of illegal something going on. But they're like, oh, okay, well, she owned a jewelry company that was very successful. Now she doesn't, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but what happens with a lot of times, in my opinion, is that entrepreneurs learn from that first experience. And then they realize whatever went wrong, whether it was their own decision or not, I took on a business partner and in a foreign country that I did not have legal rights. She was a foreign citizen. So mm -hmm. they said, we can take it to court. It's going to cost you 250,000 pounds to just retain a lawyer. Wow. Um, but we have no jurisdiction over her because you're both American passport holder, holders, both falling under the SOFA agreement. And so she would have to be charged with the criminal activity before we have to prove it before anything can happen. And that could take years. So for me, mm. it was, I'd already paid myself back. It was just mm. kind of funny money. It was a hobby. It was a, a beautiful experience, mm -hmm. but it didn't decimate my family. It didn't ruin my family. I, I could shut that door and walk away from it and, and still live my same life. Wow. So what I did learn from that is I learned what I had been doing wrong. Aside from taking on a business partner that was going to rob me blind, you know, that's sort of that, um, what I did learn was that my, my business, well, the most expensive thing was the Harden facility mm. that I had to maintain and had to maintain cleaning it and supplying it and stocking it. So I've switched my business model to a home-based business model like Mary Kay or Pampered Chef. And I have not launched it. I'm in business development. I'm getting an MBA from the University of San Francisco now um, in entrepreneurship and innovation on a scholarship to become my best businesswoman ever. Amazing. And I am changing my, my business model from having a store to home-based business sales and taking on what I'm going to call, I believe I'm going to call consultants and they will mm. sell my product. I'll fill those orders. I'll do home shows. My target audience are military spouses okay. because a lot of military spouses and don't quote me on this statistic, but there's, you know, 90% of military officer spouses have degrees. There's less than 15% that are able to use those degrees as they support their service member. I'm hoping to give them an opportunity to use their skill set and create their own empires. So, um, you know, I'm going to go traveling around um, various military bases. I hope to talk with various military officer spouses groups or enlisted spouses groups, give them the opportunity to kind of get in on the idea of creating their own business. I'm also, there's some misinformation that's out there that the military is telling military spouses. Um, every time you PCS into a new base, they tell you, oh, this, that, and the other thing. Well, there's a former spouses act that is there. And I think that every spouse should have the former, a copy of the former spouses act. It took hmm. me about two years while I was in law school to find the military spouses act. And I'd like to give those out to every spouse because it's our right of what we've earned of what we, you know, the military former spouses act, um, 
is not something that the service member is giving us. It's something that the military has decided if you put in this many years, you're entitled to base. We know that what it takes to have a military family mm -hmm. and the support and the um, the involvement that that requires. And based on that number of years, you can estimate that you've done about this much stuff or have supported our service member about this much. And therefore, this is what you're entitled to. I think every person who is a spouse should have the opportunity to know what they're entitled to and to see that on hard paper because they don't tell you that. They tell you support your spouse at all costs, even if he's doing something to you that's illegal or you know, yeah. abusing you, mistreating you, whatever that is. You're being told, suck it up because if he loses your career, you lose everything. That's actually not true. You know, you're entitled to whatever you're entitled to through that sp former spouse's act, regardless of what your spouse does. You know, now it may impact his long term, you know, his retirement status, things like that. But if you're entitled to something, you're entitled to that through that act. You know, it has nothing to do with the service member. Right. That's that's um, that's really awesome. Um, and so when it comes to building your own business and things like that, I know that you have your own philosophies and you're obviously a powerhouse and you're a wealth of information. Um, and we're actually almost out of time. I can't believe it. <laughs> but um, <laughs> what would you say to the person that's thinking about taking that leap of faith into that new job or new business opportunity or venture? Um, what would you say to them? I say this. I say there's no failure. There is only truly just learning and take the first step. The, you know, my, one of my favorite things to tell people is how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So the fear that, and the negative self-speak that people can oftentimes have within their own, you know, whatever that is, whatever psyche, whatever leads you to talk that way to yourself or to think that way about yourself, get out of that space, put that in a, put that in a corner. You don't need <laughs> that. That is not helpful to you. What's helpful to you is say, what are my strengths? Am I starting a new job? Am I a really good people person? Am I a, am I a fantastic coder? Am I a whatever? Do your job and do it well. Don't just show up and kind of get by, do it to the best, rise to the top. And then as an entrepreneur, any time that you have an opportunity to walk into something, and it, I tell people, if you feel that little, um, that little butterfly in your stomach and you have those little voices, listen to those little voices. If the little voice says, hey, you know what? This might not be the best idea. Whether you realize it or not, don't do it. Mm. If you have the little voice that goes, yep, this is right, this is for you, this is, and you have all those butterflies and you're super nervous, push it to the side and use that nervous energy, use that nervousness to explore your own depth, your own opportunities, your own um, resources that you have within yourself. Because as, as you look around your life, whether it's a LinkedIn connection, whether it is a, which are important. People yes. don't understand how LinkedIn can change your life. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a LinkedIn connection, whether it's the person at CVS that you meet, um, who I have had people walk up to me before and say, oh my God, I know exactly who you are at a function. And I was like, oh, you do? They're like, yes, I met you at a, I met you on an airplane going to Vegas one time, da, 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 and you changed my life. Wow. You were going to a funeral and you rented a, a, a um, convertible and you were driving along the coast of California. And that prompted me to go, you know, do something out of my comfort zone. It changed my life. You know, so you, you don't always get to see how it changes, but as an entrepreneur, again, as an entrepreneur, take that first step, jump off that cliff. In America, it is a beautiful thing. It's not the ruin. It's not the end of your opportunity. It's not the end of who you believe you can be. Um, it really, truly is just the start of what you're capable of. And you will surprise yourself time and time again of apply for everything, <laughs> accept everything, say yes to everything. And really, truly show up ready to roll. Don't negative self speak because that's a killer and believe in yourself. And if you need it, if you need somebody to believe in you, give me a call. Absolutely. I'll give you a little pep talk. <laughs> so since you mentioned that, how do people, um, especially uh, military spouses, get in contact with you um, after this call? So after this call, you can uh, email me at yo.fay. That's F-A-Y-E at iCloud.com. You can contact me on LinkedIn under Yolanda Fay, And I try to always get back to people. And if you reach out to me, I will always respond to you. That is amazing. Well, Yolanda, thank you so much for your time on today's call. Um, I'm sure everybody got so much value out of that. Um, and thank you for everything. 
Well, Robert, I look forward to a follow-up podcast. I look Me forward too. to talking to you through this journey. And next time, I think we should talk a little bit more about you. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, for your time and energy, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.